So welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Dean Prastakos. I'm the dean of the School of Business. And I welcome everybody to uh, uh, the Heath Lecture that we organize uh, for this semester. As you know, the, the Heath Lectures are the uh, uh, most important uh, lectures we give in the school. And uh, they always attract a huge interest. And as a result of this, we always make sure we have terrific speakers. So uh, this uh, year's uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Sandeep Sachetti. And we want to welcome Dr. Sachetti to our School of Business. Um, <laughs> Dr. Sachetti is, uh, is uh, going to be talking about a number of things which are very, very close to what we preach, to what we teach, to what we practice. So he will talk about how the most basic processes and simplest analytics can deliver transformational value to the firm. And Dr. Sacchetti will exemplify how the power is not in big data, but in big thinking. Dr. Sandeep Sacchetti is Executive Vice President of Customer Information Management and Operational Excellence for Walters Kluber, a market-leading global information services and software company. He was Executive Director of Business Risk Analysis at UBS in his previous job. And before that, he was Vice President of Risk Management at American Express. And as I just found out, he was the boss of our, one of our dear professors, Herman Kramer. Okay. Dr. Sacchetti has a wide range of experience in, I would say, most of the key aspects of any business school. And I explain experience in risk, information, and operations management. His specialties include small business credit management, information management, data analytics, product development, cost customer development relationship management, and fraud risk management. Dr. Sacchetti holds over 20 patents in decision sciences and fraud verification. He has a PhD from the University of California at Berkeley. Ladies and gentlemen, I am thrilled to invite a visionary leader in finance and analytics, Executive Vice President Sandeep Sacchetti, to the podium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Dean. I'm, I'm humbled and honored to be here. Uh, first, uh, a few weeks ago, probably a couple of months ago, Professor Aronson called and said, hey, would you like to be on the panel here and uh, talk to some of the students? And like, I debated and I said, what, what can I share with all of you guys? You already are some of the brightest and the smartest kids out there, and there's not a whole lot I can share. Somehow he convinced me that I really should come. And then he told me there's going to be about 150 students. So I got a little scared. All these young minds, and my information and my knowledge is quite dated now. I used to be in your seat, I want to say not too long ago, but it feels like now a long time ago. Okay. Then I find out why all of you are here. It's not to listen to me. And if you're really honest, you'll raise your hand and say, you're really not here to listen to me. There's three reasons why I feel you're here. First, it's really bad outside. Where else are you going to be? <laughs> Second, free food. Remember, I used to be a hungry student once. <laughs> and so I know how you guys live. Hi, Ted. Uh, second, uh, and the third, there was a sign-up sheet here. <laughs> I noticed that. It's like everybody's lining up, taking their cookies and signing up. You weren't signing up because you took a cookie. You were signing up because your professors made you come here. <laughs> so with that note, thank you for welcoming me. <laughs> so I don't believe in decks, even though as a person spending lots of years in corporate world, 
my life is run by a PowerPoint. And it's one of those very rare occasions for me to actually not utilize a PowerPoint to make the point. So my hope is that we'll engage in a dialogue and we'll actually ask each other many questions. And I'll just utilize a few, few pages here because I was forced to utilize a few pages. Okay? Very importantly, everybody's been talking about big data. How big data is changing uh, the world, how it's gonna revolutionize everything. It's gonna just create awesome opportunities for all of you. I think it's gonna bake bread as well pretty soon. So let's look at some of the, the types of things that people are finding using big data. Some of these things I'm sure you'll be finding pretty soon as well as you are preparing for your uh, next phase in life. Here's a good one. All of you are young. You're all going through relationships right now, I'm sure. So it's important to understand what big data is saying about relationships. So here's a, a discovery by some pretty eminent big data scientists that relationships break up before Valentine's Day. You guys can all see it? Okay. Uh, big screen, uh, spring cleanup happens. <laughs> Does that match your own experiences? Yeah, I see some head nods. Um, April Fool's Day, why? I have no idea. <laughs> Mondays seem to be good days to break up. Summer, nobody wants to break up before, uh, at Christmas time. So that's good. But two weeks before that, watch out. <laughs> that's pretty impressive that we now know so much about relationships through big data. Here's another one. People who died by falling out of wheelchairs is highly correlated to price of potato chips. <laughs> Not my studies, by the way, guys. I'm just telling you what I'm reading in the newspapers and in, in the popular media about big data. 0.97 correlation, pretty amazing, right? By the way, if you plotted my mother's age on this, the correlation would be about the same. <laughs> yeah. Here's another one. Selfie accidents have killed more people than shark attacks. <laughs> and by the way, the article actually goes about writing it. It sounds like a joke. This is not me. I'm just saying, in the article it said, and I found this very interesting, it sounds like a joke, but unfortunately, it, it isn't. <laughs> wow, this is serious work. The question is, is this true big data? And is this what data science is about? Now we know some of these interesting insights. What would you do different? scientific research. This is not cause and effect at all. This is an association correlation which doesn't mean anything. <laughs> That's why we have professors in the room. <laughs> we must do valid cause and effective relationship analysis. But there was a, um, I don't want to take your time, to a relationship with polio and amount of soft drinks. Later on it became clear that none of these are correlated to each other. It is the heat. I'm sorry. So, so, so there you go. See, this is the point of, that, that's why you are in school. Learn the theory, it's important, it matters. And yes, correlations are interesting, and for very short periods of time, they're often actually quite predictive as well. Don't get fooled by it. I may be in the traditional school of classical statistics, I'm just saying it's a viewpoint. Now, I'm not saying the other viewpoint is absolutely wrong because a lot of people make a lot of good money on, <laughs> you know. That said, you might want to double check sometimes, at least question. 
certainly these studies, knowing that you're going to have more breakups two weeks before Christmas, would you avoid those two weeks? Would you run away from having... Maybe that's a strategy. Any psychologists in the room? Maybe there's some real motivation and answers around why this happens. But it's not clear what I would do different knowing all of this information. And unless there's a meaningful impact, you have to worry about what is the point of this. So what I want to do is really just have a conversation with you about how do we go from flash? Remember, these studies actually created a lot of headlines. And if our idea of success is to get, get headlines, then look for the esoteric. Look for the, the thing that is going to catch the newspaper's eye. And if our idea of success is to create meaningful value for something that matters, then you may want to think about it differently. Yeah. So I'm going to share with you a few experiences. And this is it. That's it. I just have one slide. I don't have a big presentation. So if you're expecting there's going to be a big reveal after this, there is no big reveal. <laughs> this is it. Okay. So focus on impact. And I'm going to give you a commercial viewpoint meaning from the industry, not from academia. Because I believe that with all the professors in the room, I'm least qualified to give you an academic viewpoint. Nor am I going to actually talk about what techniques did you, should you should use, what you should learn and all. I already assume that you already are masters of that. If you're trying to focus on impact, know what matters. Read. Read sounds like stay in school. Good, you're already in school. From a company perspective, as you, uh, as you guys prepare for your next interview, or as you guys think about your next career in life with any company, understand what matters to that company. Not all companies are created equal. Yes, everybody's after profitability but different ways to get there. And often reading their annual report, just first page itself will tell you exactly how they make money and how the stock market values them. Some companies are cash flow companies. Some companies care a lot about giving dividends back to their shareholders. Others claim high growth. That's their market valuation based on. So if you know which parameter is more important to them, then you can actually figure out what matters to them and how do the techniques and the, the data science that you are learning can be pivoted according to the needs of that company. If you're going into a cell phone company, churn management is a big important topic for them. So you can actually say, hey, these techniques that I've learned, here's how I can apply to your business to grow your business, bottom line or top line. So knowing what matters to the company is important. Second is look for the multiplier effect. What do I mean by that? Now imagine you've made a big discovery in a company. Is it a discovery that you can actually embed in the way the company runs? And if you can, think about it. Those decisions get made again and again and again and again. And every single time, because of your analysis, because of your recommendation, if that decision is even marginally better, because it's taking place multiple times, the multiplier effect takes over. Versus if you did an analysis that was utilized only once, that may still be quite valuable. However, you lose the multiplier effect. So I always try to look for problems that actually are repeated. 
And those often absolutely happen to be the non-sexy problems. Okay. So if you look at a call center, so can I do predictive dialing? It's like, ah, call center, well, why do you want to spend two minutes on call center? That's not sexy. Nobody's going to talk about that. Yeah, but if, uh, if the company is a, a company that sells catalogs, it happens all the time. That's their business model. And if you can make that call just 2% more effective, guess what? The millions of calls that are getting made, 2% of millions is a large number. So try to embed the smarts that you figured out into the way of the running the business. No matter how small it is. It's not the size of the finding, it's not the size of the, the opportunity, it's the, the way the business is gonna be run going forward. That creates a multiplier effect. The next one that uh, I find very interesting and I've fallen uh, into trap on this one myself many, many times over. Uh, you arrived at this point in your career, in your own life, because you are incredibly good. You're a perfectionist. I think I'm a perfectionist. Until I really am satisfied with the last dot, all the, the T's are crossed, all the do I's are dotted, I don't want to hand in my homework. I want to get an A plus. And I'm sure all of you guys feel the same way. Unfortunately in life, timing matters. So this I call information as half-life. So if your analysis arrives a day after the decision needs to be made, how valuable is your insight? Negative. Why? Because you're expensive. As data scientists, you command a fairly <coughs> significant salary, right? So the fact that you're bringing in a recommendation the day after the recommendation was needed, I'm sorry, you just destroyed value for the company. If you brought in at the right time, the information has more value. And you've got to look at all decisions and say, what decision is required to be discussed and at what frequency or what interval? So many decisions are not decisions to be taken on face value. They get debated in companies. You have to get buy-in from many players, from your colleagues, from your superiors, from different departments. You've got to get them aligned. You often need to get them coded into the system. All that change requires time. And again, if you bring in a decision, recommendation, at the right time, it's got tremendous value because everybody's aligned, they're excited about driving the change, it's gonna get embedded in the right processes, it's gonna drive the right value. So it is important that we as data scientists or policy recommenders or business analysts or whatever your profession is going to be in future. The more you know what is the right time of the decision, better yet, what is the right time to make your recommendation, your value increases multiply. In business, sometimes good enough is good enough. The difference between A plus and B minus is actually not as significant as you might think. If you get an A plus, but at the wrong time, that's interesting. You get a B, but at the right time, you're a hero. So remember when to make the trade-off of perfection necessary or 
right now good enough because I need to meet a deadline to get, thing, get this thing into the, the way the company runs. Now, this, this uh, advice works only in certain types of professions also. Now, if you're trying to save somebody's life and your analysis was critical for that, be careful, don't, <laughs> don't utilize the Heath Lecture as the way to <laughs> execute. <laughs> so I read this in school, they said. <laughs> the next point is uh, all your wonderful analysis is worth only if you're able to convince somebody else that this is the way to go. Storytelling matters. Communication matters. I just recently had a very good opportunity to uh, talk to uh, three students from, I can't see them right now, but I'm sure they're somewhere here, uh, who finished a project for us recently. It's estimating um, from Chris's class. Uh, it's actually looking at a two-sided market and how do we optimize uh, work allocation for a two-sided market, a thriving two-sided market. It can be a very complex problem, but they really kind of simplified it, created a model in Excel, then programmed it in Python. At the end of it, they really did a fantastic job. Lena, uh, Subu, and Subuji, and Subu V, right? right. Uh, the three of them did a fantastic job of convincing us as to why that is a good model. Storytelling is important. More important than the sophistication of the technique. Keeping it practical, keeping it simple, keeping it robust is far more important than, I got one more thing going and I have a little bit more sophisticated model. I'm not against sophistication, don't get me wrong. We obviously want the best technique for the problem. But remember the other side who is often in the decision making seat may not be able to appreciate all the work that you're trying to do. So how do you convince the other side in the simplest possible terms that what you're offering is actually a game changer. So storytelling matters, it really does. So that was on focus. Any questions, thoughts? Please. Um, uh, so I'm thinking about, uh, besides those four points, uh, we, uh, as a manager, uh, we always deal with some um, uncertainty stuff, especially uh, for current uh, uh, current time we have the uh, so big data set, mm -hmm. and uh, well, we hard to control the data quality sometimes. Mm -hmm. And uh, the process of dealing with data, what kind of methodology you are choosing uh, to solve the problem, sometimes will lead to the different results. So, as a manager, my question is, how do you make a decision under such uncertainty? Excellent question. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, these are not the only four things that matter, right? They just are randomly picked uh, as things that you might want to think about. Clearly, uncertainty and decision making under uncertainty is a whole body of work that I hope you guys are taking good courses on. Uh, decision un under uncertainty is a very important topic. That said, your question of, uh, we have lots of data, you analyze it, depending on sometimes the technique, sometimes the sampling methodology, you, can, you may come up with different recommendations and sometimes those are completely diametrically opposite of each other. And so what we try to do, never bet the farm on just one recommendation. Experiment, 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 experiment. There's no substitute to learning in market. No amount of theory can replace what the market is going to tell you. So what we often do is, the recommendation has come in, good. Implement it in a sample. See what happens, what the reaction is. 
then iterate around it because you learn a lot more and see it if you can sometimes you can and sometimes you cannot seed five experiments with your different recommendations and different techniques and see what happens the reaction of the marketplace so that's one way of reducing uncertainty there are many other techniques also for this though any other questions or thoughts okay let's look at some of the other uh, thinking on leadership how many of you have a career plan show of hands none of you have a career plan oh my god <laughs> we're in trouble okay three people have a career plan the rest of you you're going to be okay <laughs> I did not have a career plan. Not that I'm saying that I've been incredibly successful or anything like that, or that it would not have been better if I had a plan. All I'm saying is that having a five-year plan, it works for some people. And if you're a planner, good for you. It's going to be good. If you're not a planner, it's still going to be okay. My point is that in this day and age, learn to pivot even if you have a plan guess what you learn new things and as you learn new things you'll be posed with lots of choices and as long as you're flexible enough and pivoting i think you'll be fantastic for my personal career i'll give you one story um, i never wanted to be in the industry i wanted to be a professor that's what i wanted to do and here i was a phd student uh, doing my academic thing and presenting a paper at american economic association this was many moons ago uh, some of you were not probably even born uh, i hope you were all born though not that old i had done my presentation of my paper and nothing else to do so i'm just roaming around the halls I see this company with a booth, and I'm always one of those guys that just randomly ask questions, right? So what do you guys do? Ah, uh, well, this, that. So that's interesting. So what kind of things do you utilize to? Oh, we, we utilize our econometric models. Uh, we do logistic regression to estimate this and pr predict that. So, oh, that's interesting. I'm taking a course in that. So, so well, why don't you come and talk to us? You know, hungry graduate student, right? So I said, excellent, where are you guys based? So, well, come to Arizona. So, free trip, man. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. I have no desire to go and work for this company. I'm just saying, I'll go to visit Grand Canyon. That was my rationale for going there. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, 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 I, I was married by that time. So, so bring your wife as well. We'll let you rent a car you'll stay there and i say fantastic man i'll make a nice vacation out of it <laughs> that nice vacation turned into a job yeah i never expected to find myself doing that my point is that i i don't know if i took the right path or not unfortunately in life you cannot always do an ab test <laughs> i wish i could right we all do, but life doesn't pose always that opportunity to test and then say, see, I could have chosen that path and the loss was this and therefore I'll do. So be willing to pivot. Question, be intensely curious. You might know everything. If you talk, you might learn a little bit more. So I'll give you one more story. Okay. This is two years ago. So remember, I'm a data geek. Okay. That's what I've done forever. So two years ago, there was, I was walking uh, our office hallway. This is at the company that I'm in right now. And I see a big dumpster, massive, with uh, fresh envelopes with uh, stamps put on it 
uh, being thrown fully loaded. Okay. So, so I, what do I do? I put my hand in the dumpster. I take uh, one of those letters and I say, oh, that's interesting. It's got a stamp on it. It looks fresh. It's not mail that uh, we received. It's mail actually that we printed and we are throwing it out. So why would we do such a thing? Why would we print something, stuff it into an envelope, put a stamp on it only to just put it in the dumpster? That doesn't make sense, right? So. Randomly, I ask a, uh, a person who was sitting right there, and I knock on her and say, oh, do you know what this is? No, I did not realize who I, was, who I was asking this question of. Her name is Svetlana. She's been with the company 33 years. She's retiring actually next month. Um, she looked at me and said, who the hell are you? <laughs> Like, I got a shock. I, 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 I'm just asking. He said, mind your own business. I said, uh, Svetlana, I'm just wanting to, you know, I mean, we're throwing good envelopes. So that doesn't sound a good idea. Can you just help me understand? Well, what do you think we are? We're wasting money or what? You know, this, we printed this batch, and it was wrong printing, and that's why we don't want to send it to customers to bother them. So we're throwing it away. So oh, okay, I'm glad that you know we don't want to bother our customers. That's a good instinct. But why would we waste money? Huh? She just yelled at me more and said, "Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I asked." And I continued on. Right? Next day she came and said, "Well, I'm sorry, I yelled at you. Uh, let me explain." She says, "Okay, this has been happening for last three years." We do a large mailing in February, March, or something like that for some tax purposes. And we have a glitch in our computer program. We always print it, and it just forces us to print. And then we kind of waste the money, and then we throw it away. Okay. So that's crazy. Come on. How much would it cost to change, fix the program? Well, it's not about cost. It's actually about prioritization. We don't get prioritized, and therefore, this just is continuing on every, every year. That one question, remember I'm a data scientist. I've never actually done anything in operations. I've known nothing about running anything like that. So I dug deeper, 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 asked five more people. Then we finally figured out why that is the, the problem. We fixed it. A few months later, because of that project, I don't know if it was because of that project or whatever it was. It's coincidence. I then got uh, asked to run the entire operations organization. Okay. So I could have never imagined running an operations organization as a data scientist. Now, was the catalyst the, the dumpster or that lady? I have no clue. It may be pure coincidence. But my point is, again, be curious. Because you never know what you'll learn. You'll never know what you'll learn. So ask your friend what they are doing. Ask about their other projects. Talk to your colleagues. You might find a new job out of it. You might learn something that you'll apply three years later. <laughs> Last but not the least is you might be an individual genius. But even Einstein needed a team. Even Edison needed a team. And so will you. Analytics is a team sport. No matter what anybody tells you, no matter how much, how many wonderful R programs you write on your own, it's a team sport. Especially as you go into a professional life, you'll not always have access to your own data. You'll have to get somebody else to give you data. It'll not always be clean. You'll have to get somebody else's help to get, clean this. Even if you come up with the wonderful recommendation, you'll not be the guy to actually implement it. You'll have to get somebody else to implement it. 
you'll have to talk to a marketer, you'll have to talk to a product leader, you'll have to get the operations guy convinced why your recommendation is better and therefore this is the way to talk to customers on the phone. Or you'll have to travel with a salesperson and say, well, let me tell you if the leads that I'm generating out of my model are better, that you'll actually make more money. Those things require us to be part of a team. They require us to speak their language. If we speak our statistical language, that may be good in our community, necessary. But that's not necessarily the language the rest of the world speaks. So we've got to be part of a team. Big things happen in teams. Big things don't happen by individuals. You may not win a Nobel Prize, but remember, you did not choose this profession or the, the commercial career path for winning Nobel Prizes. It's to make an impact in whatever you choose. Teams matter. So with that, I'll, I ask you guys to again, what's on your mind? This is the, the, the quietest uh, student body that I've ever been in. Please, go ahead. Uh, this may not be entirely related to uh, teams, but something that crossed my mind um, is that when you hear the term big data, you, I kind of think of privacy. So as a data scientist, where is there like a sort of ethics angle? Like, when do you stop pushing people for data on people? Because obviously, like, certain information for many corporations that may seem a little invasive would be very useful for a data scientist. So I, I don't know uh, if that's entirely related to what you want to talk about, but. No, it's a legitimate question. Uh, it's, uh, I'll give you two perspectives on it, two competing perspectives, because I'm not sure there's a really straightforward, simple answer that I have. Uh, there are probably privacy experts here that uh, have thought a lot more about it. First and foremost, not all data is personally identifiable information. So in the industry parlance, it's called uh, PII, personally identifiable information. Not all information is in that category. Vast majority of information actually is, I say vast, I say large percentage of the information is not personally ident identifiable. And it's okay to analyze all of it. Second is that I don't know if there is a one event that causes people to re suddenly realize that uh, my privacy is being infringed on. Because we've been so used to now in society that over decades of just one more bit, one more bit, one more bit, one more bit available in the public domain. And so did you realize that your information was all available yesterday or did you realize that Facebook happened, what, 10 years ago, right? And even before that, a lot of information was available. So slowly but surely your privacy gets degraded over time, right? So I'm not sure there's one event that you would stop either. I think as society we have to come together and say what are the norms on this? And then. How are you going to enforce those norms? I don't know what the answers are. And to some extent, uh, you know, it's a, it's, I hope somebody's doing that research. I certainly don't have the capacity to do that research. We do often deal with a lot of commercial information. And that has nothing to do with anything private. Okay? Because those are publicly available, public company information. I'm glad all of it is available and more of it should be available. People information, different subject. Right? So I didn't answer your question because it's not an easy question to answer. Yeah. I really like what um, you said. Uh, I, mean, I like the presentation so far, it's really great. But I, what really stuck with me is what you said at the beginning about the focus on the impact and focusing on what's important to the company and what's important to the system. And what 
I was thinking in my head when that popped up is something that was really important uh, that's coming up today is you know, it's called cloud computing. And cloud computing to me is a very fascinating concept and has a lot of potential in collecting statistical data analysis, especially in large companies and small companies, uh, even from a public. Uh, what are your thoughts on the analysis of big data via super cloud computers? So it's a good thing is the short answer. <laughs> uh, and I'll give you another cynical viewpoint. It's kind of like what, what, uh, what was old is new again. Uh, so if you go, you know, there are enough uh, professors in the, the room who actually have some experience in this. So back in the day, everybody used to sit in front of a dumb terminal and the data used to be stored somewhere else, right? The programs and data. Well, well, that's exactly what cloud computing to some extent is, right? Cloud is not like a real cloud, right? You guys all get that, right? It's a server somewhere else. Yeah. Whether it's a server farm in multiple places or, but it's a physical thing somewhere else. The thing that most companies suffer by is the ability to constantly upgrade their systems and be up to date and also manage the, the other things that are important to that company. So what companies are realizing is that most companies are not technology companies. So is it their core competency to actually manage servers? For Google it is, for Microsoft it is, but for a company like ours, that's not our core competency. And if an Amazon Web Services comes along and says, wait, we do this for a living, great. Now we can tap into that resource. So herein lies a second que related question to the privacy question, though. Okay. There's a little bit of a hesitation right now that if I put things on the cloud, today you say that it's really controlled, it's a private cloud versus a public cloud, and there are security cons you know, uh, considerations and all that. Time will tell. So are we creating singular choke points, where if somebody hacked into that, the Amazon Web Services, then <laughs> or <laughs> distributed choke points. Either way, I think we as a world are better off by having somebody else do things that they are specialized in versus every other company trying to figure out how to manage their own web platform or their own uh, infrastructure. Uh, so, so I think analytics actually will benefit tremendously by moving it into the cloud. I agree. I think it's going to be something that's going to look at in the future. But I also think it's kind of like a double-edged sword because if the server does go down, something happens that super computer, then all that data is lost. But I still think to an extent, companies will need to have a live on itself, copy its own data just in case. But I agree, I think it's definitely something that's going to be very interesting in the future. It's a matter of what is the failure rate of that supercomputer, the cloud, versus the, the company's computers. You don't think compu company's computers fail? They fail all the time, right? So, you gotta make your trade off. Um, how do you build a great team? How do you find the right people to achieve what you're trying to achieve? Diversity. Uh, first and foremost, all problems that we generally are um, needing to be solved, they're multidisciplinary problems. Typically, problems that matter require multidisciplinary approach. So you need to have a, a person who's got a design thinking, you've got a person who's got a visualization skill, you've got a person who's got a programming skill, you've got a person who's got a deep analytical approach to things, you've got a person who's more technical in nature, and these skills, or rather the, 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 the way you size those skills in a team, it varies on a problem. So not all problems are created equal, right? But depending on what you're trying to solve for, you want to scale as much of this diversity as possible. And that goes back to, you need to be able to work across all those disciplines collectively to be successful.
Thank you for a great lecture, Cindy. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Invite a student to present you with a gift of token of appreciation. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so, you so much. much.